Hello and good good morning to you. We are so, so thankful uh, for your presence here today. I'm going to walk down and get this clicker real quick. God has been good to us and beginning of this new week and worship to him is uh, such a wonderful and a, a great privilege that we have as his people. So we thank you for uh, your presence here today. We do want to say thank you as for your response and in investing in the gospel meeting a week ago. We were so blessed by great lessons from Brother Levi and by Brother Ryan on Friday night and Saturday from Levi and then Ryan on Sunday. Uh, we did miss having Lonnie with us, Lonnie Jones, but we did not miss out. We did not miss out on hearing truth and being able to worship together. And so we're, we're delighted that they were able to help us. And we're thankful for those of you who invested in your souls and in your family to be able to be a part of that. Be sure that you grab a bulletin and have the addresses there of Levi and Ryan. Uh, send them a thank you note to pray for them. Uh, just especially because they did it on short notice, but, uh, but also because they're going about the Lord's business uh, every day and every week in their own setting, and we're, we're so appreciative uh, to them. Last week's bulletin had Lonnie's address, if you want to send him a get well note, and I can get that to you if you need me to. Also, I want you to, if, if you have a calendar that you keep regularly and you have that on you, maybe it's in your phone or in your purse or something, pull out your calendar. Like I'm, go ahead and take the time to pull out your calendar and mark on it for 2024. The gospel meeting for next year has already been planned. It's been planned for several years, and it's already set. It's a weekend later in order to, to work with Brother Winkler's schedule. So it's not the first weekend in February and the first Sunday in February. It's the second Sunday in February and the Friday and Saturday before that. So mark that now. If we sit back and we wait and see, if we sit back and, and hope nothing else falls on that weekend, it's guaranteed we'll find something else we would prefer to do. So we can mark it now and ensure that we plan around it or we can wait and see. And we're asking you to mark it and plan around it. So second full weekend and then the first, second Sunday of, of February. Brother Dan Winkler is Brother Wendell Winkler's oldest son. And we got to talking. We don't think we've ever had Dan here at Parish. We know we had Mike Winkler before we started working here with you. Uh, but we look forward to having Dan. He's a powerful proclaimer of the gospel. Uh, his kind of full-time, um, this season of his life, later season of his life, he is, he is devoting to younger generations. So millennials and Gen Z and on down, uh, that's been his aim. Uh, he doesn't want to, to give up on those younger generations. And so he's doing a great job in, in producing resources and writing books and, and traveling around doing meetings and so forth with that in mind. And we appreciate his heart for serving the Lord and his knowledge of the scriptures, but also the powerful way in which he proclaims it. So be sure that you're here, Lord willing in a year from now, a year from this weekend. So at the end of 2019, two ladies wrote an article together on BuzzFeed, which is sort of a news kind of organization. And the title, I, I get, it's clever. Uh, they called it this, The Decade Let Us Tried to Kill Us. Pretty creative graphic there of a, a head of lettuce looking like a monster. Uh, but the, the goal in the article really was just to kind of list all of the different outbreaks that happened, contamination outbreaks that happened via lettuce over the course of the 2010s. And there are some pretty obvious reasons why there was an increase in those, but it is staggering just to find out that since 2010-ish or so, the vast majority, or at least right at half, vast majority is not the best word of choice, but right about half of all foodborne illness comes from vegetables and fruit. It's much lower than that for beef. It's much lower than that for chicken and pork combined. It's much, much lower from seafood. We commonly think of those meat categories maybe as having the higher level of, of potential for co contamination. And yet there's a higher instance of contamination via produce. But they write about this and, and they try to, to make it kind of lighthearted and so forth. But the idea was, hey, we saw some big news outbreaks that we've not really seen in a while. And, of course, the one that gets the most headlines was from 2018 and 2019, so they're writing with some recency bias as they write that. But there was that outbreak of romaine lettuce, first in Arizona and then later another farm in California. And all told, that was one of the worst outbreaks in, in over a decade. Six people died. 210 or so were infected, infected by that E. coli strain. 96 had to be hospitalized, and some of them ended up having more or less permanent kidney failure as a result all from the lettuce they ate. Now, you can trace it mostly to irrigation problems. What was feeding the lettuce 
became contaminate, contaminated. And romaine lettuce is especially vulnerable because its leaves are growing so close to the surface of the ground. It's not only does it pull up this nourishment from its roots like a traditional plant, but it's also pulling in these nutrients from its leaves, and that's sitting in the water of the dirt. So it's especially vulnerable. And then we eat it raw, and we have this increase in wanting to eat healthier, increased consumption of lettuce and salads, and it all makes for a combination of increased outbreaks for these kind of things. So just with that kind of background in mind, we ask a simple, obvious question. Would we eat produce if we suspected that it had been grown in a poisonous environment? If we just thought it was possible that the environment it was growing up in was poisonous, would we risk it and eat produce grown in that environment? I mean, it's pretty obvious that if we thought there was a chance, we would say, eh, no thanks, I'll pass. Or no thanks, I'll cook it instead. I'll be sure it's cooked so that it kills anything in it. And when those outbreaks happen, they pull way more than is necessary just to be sure there's no chance, right? And so we need to approach this study this morning as we think about John 15 just with the world in mind too. Because we rightly want the world to know more about Jesus Christ and we know that that's designed to flow through us as his people. But is the world interested in what we have if what we produce looks very similar to what they produce? If everything we bear out of our lives is hurried and stressed and anxious and snappy and divisive, what, what do we have different than what they have? What Jesus is going to do is he moves from the metaphorical, metaphorical language of early John 15. He's going to pivot in verse number 9 to then showing how that looks. So John 15 and verse 8, our key verse for this study, but for the whole year in fact, he says, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Remember, he's laid out this construction. He is the vine, the Father's the vine dresser, we are the branches, and it's through him being connected to him that we bear fruit. Well, the whole purpose of that imagery is to remind us we're in a world that's against us, but also in a world that needs that fruit because it needs the source of the fruit who is God. So we begin to see then as he applies this in verse number 9 is that we prove to be his disciples. A disciple, we traditionally kind of start that talking, defining it as a learner. We also know that means it's a follower. I learn from a certain teacher. I follow his conduct. What does it mean when now when we talk about a fruit-bearing disciple? Is what we'll try to make some connections with this morning. What we learn, just by summary, in this text especially, is the inseparable connection between obedience and our discipleship. You can't be a disciple of Jesus who's inactive. You can't be a disciple of Jesus who picks and chooses commandments of Jesus. But instead, it's continual obedience. That's how we remain connected. Remember the key verb in verses 1 through 8 is abide, stay connected. Well, that's that continual obedience. That's how we remain connected to Jesus. And it's also how the world is going to ever be influenced by the love of Jesus Christ. We can do nothing apart from him. Our lives depend on him. And so too the opportunities for the world to come to know him depend on us staying closely connected to him. So let's move into chapter 15, the rest of it. And we might kind of reference a little bit in chapter 16, just fleshing out this idea of discipleship, what it looks like to be his disciple as we bear fruit. So let's read beginning of verse number 9, very next verse. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. You already begin to see this progression, but notice just one thing before we move on. Verse number 9 equates abiding in his love to abiding in him. How am I supposed to abide in you? Well, you abide in his love. Verse number 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So now he's answering another question. Well, how do I abide in your love, Jesus? Abide in me, abide in my love. How do I do that? You abide, you remain in my commandments. If you abide in my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, verse 11, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. There's something that sustained Jesus the whole time. He's looking on to something greater. And he says, when you listen to me, love, commandments, connected, obedience, you'll begin to see why I am so full and able to endure. I want you to be full. 
of the same thing that fills me. So verse number 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. So now he's pivoted in verse number 9 from talking about fruit, metaphor, vine. What's the first thing he talks about in verse number 9? Love. It's not a coincidence. When Paul talks about walking with the Spirit and producing the things of the Spirit, what's the first thing he says is the, the qualities of the fruit of the Spirit? Love. Joy, peace, patience. After having emphasized the importance of love previously in Galatians chapter 5. So now he says, love has flown, flowed from the Father through him and now to us. And so we see the, the clear process. The process is not for us to just simply do what we think we ought to do or to do the, the best we can do. Instead, it's to go back to him because he's always drawing from the Father. We cannot know true love until we know Jesus Christ and thus know his love. To love is to obey. To obey is to love. One author said this, that love is both the fruit of remaining in Jesus. We stay closely connected to him, and what do we do? We produce love. But it also is a command. We're commanded to love. And that's a conditional. You, you can't stay in him if you don't love. It's also the commandment that functions as a condition for remaining in him. It's a, it's a clear cycle. We can't ignore what true love is and still remain in him. John said it even more concisely. We love because he first loved us. So we must see this necessary connection that true love leads to obedience and true obedience will lead to love. If we find ourselves at the end of the day saying, well, you know, I, I could have handled today better. I needed to be more loving. I need, to, I need to exercise true love more effectively. Then lean into obedience. If we get to the end of the day and we think, I need to be more obedient. I missed some things in terms of, of following Christ and making good, holy decisions. I need to be better at being obedient that we lean into our love. We study more about what love looks like in the life of God. And then it's then that he says, verse 11, when I've spoken these things to you and you listen, you'll have the same joy, fulfillment that I have. So the process is clear. It starts with the Father, goes through Christ in our lives, in our love, and that's when we can begin in verse number 12 to love one another. You see the progression in the text, right? 9 and 10, my love, the Father's love, your love for me, then verse number 12, it begins to be outward. Your love for others. Love me, but then learn to love one another. And you can only love one another by learning to love me. Then he answers a question in verse number 13 we might be asking. Well, if you said to love one another as you have loved us, how do you love, one another? How do you love us? He's actually said that in this previous discourse back in chapter 13. Remember, he's washed his, their feet. That's the role of a slave. John 13, 34, 35, as I have loved you, you are to love one another. Well, here he again says, love one another as I have loved you. They might have thought back in chapter 13, right after the feet washing, oh, we need to, to kneel down and, and get our hands dirty some and, and be willing to, to wash people's feet. That's a decent application. But Jesus is saying, to find my love, to abide in my love, it demands much much more even than that. He defines what his love looks like in the very next verse of chapter 15. Verse number 13. Greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. He came with a mission and a purpose, and that purpose was to die. He intentionally planned everything he planned in order to lay down his entire life more than kneel down to give up his life. You want a picture of the type of love that you're to have for each and every one else? You look to the cross. You look to his standard of sacrifice. Paul would say it similarly in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. By this God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You can't get love without seeing sacrifice and knowing sacrifice. And this is a a bit of a side point, but it's, it's necessary to see right here. We will spend the entire month of April, Lord willing, talking about love, only about love in April. But notice here, love is far more than a feeling. The Father's love was not just a feeling toward the Son. It was seen in action. 
the son's love for the father was far more than just feeling a certain way about the father. It was seen in action, specifically in keeping his commandments. The son's love is far more than a feeling toward us. He doesn't just have warm thoughts about mankind. Jesus says, I am willing to give. I lay down my life. So if ever we enter discussions about love, and we say, I love this person, I love that person, I love the world, I do love the lost. Are we thinking about love in terms of sacrifice and sacrificial action, willing to show them what comes from God? Notice how one of the apostles present that day talks about this in 1 John chapter 2. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Oh, oh you say you know God. You say you're, you're a follower of his. Well, what's understood to happen? Well, you keep the commandments he gives. Whoever says, I know him, verse 4, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. And then by this, we may know that we are in him. It's abide language, abide in me as the vine. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. You see the, the overlap of all these themes. You could almost see John saying, I remember that day, the upper room, and then Jesus going to the, the garden, and in between, talk about the vine and the branches and his love and abiding and staying in him. And the result is we're his disciples, 15 and verse 8, and we ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. This one text, and John, it's, it's full of this, multiple times in 1 John. We need the reminder that we can say we do one thing while doing another, even as people of God. We can say we do one thing while actually doing another. And John says, it's not enough to just say. And in fact, if you do say, I abide in him or I love others or, or whatever the case is, and yet the actions don't follow, it's as good as being a liar. But also notice verse number six. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. That's a, a word that, that communicates the expectation, the demand, must, but it carries a different level of meaning too. Why should we have to? Why ought we? Typically, ought carries the connotation of, of obligation or indebtedness. Think of how much we, quote, owe God because of his love for us. It's such a privilege that he reveals his love toward us, that we get to bathe in the overwhelming and overflowing love of God. So the only natural response we ought to then keep looking to Jesus and live the life he lived. So kind of wrapping a lot of this up, this is true about love, and it's also true about any fruit from our lives. Okay, we talked about love because that's what Jesus talked about. But I want us to see the process is true about anything. Anything that's going to come out of our lives is only true as followers of God because it starts with God. So that's holiness, that's joy, that's peace, that's patience, on down the list from Galatians 5, discipline, Anything else that God desires and designed us to bear in our lives first must start with him. It doesn't start with our hard work. It starts with going and submitting to him. And then it's through us that it begins to be born as fruit and seen as fruit before others. Our interactions with each other, this loving others and treating others, we, we have a horizontal aspect of our lives. We can't live in isolation from each other. And so Jesus draws that connection for us. Everything you've gotten from me, you're now going to love others and treat others with it. If those are horizontal pieces of fabric, strands of fabric in a piece of fabric, if you pull those out, what happens? The rest of it falls apart. You pull the vertical fabric pieces out, it falls apart. And so he is saying that necessarily your life depends on you drawing from God but showing it to others. And if we ignore either aspect, the relational aspect of life with each other or the relational aspect to God, then our lives begin to fall apart. And so just as God came as flesh and blood in the form of Jesus, the likeness of Jesus, the life of Jesus, he came in that capacity to save the world. Hebrews makes it clear he had to be made like his brothers in the flesh. Likewise, he now sends disciples who are flesh and blood 
into the world in order to save the world. So just as God came as flesh and blood to save the world, he now sends us as flesh and blood disciples into the world. The world is full of people. And he sends people who have been changed and transformed in the likeness of Jesus into the world of people to let him be known. A couple of application questions just to, to connect the dots for us on this first idea. When we think back to any word or conversation that we have or any action that we do, maybe it's reflexive even in nature. We hadn't thought about it, we just do it. Or maybe it's an intentional decision. When we think back on it, can we show that it comes from Jesus? That's a different way of thinking than what we might typically do, which is justification. We do something and then we turn around and say, oh, well, it was okay that I did this because of whatever. This is a question not about justification, but instead origination. Where did that thought come from? Where did that word come from? Where did that action come from? Where did that decision come from? Instead of trying to defend everything we do, what if we instead tried to trace back everything we do so that we can ensure it's coming from actively our relationship to God through Jesus Christ? And since we're concerned most about what Jesus is concerned about, 15 verse 8 reminds us it needs to glorify God. How, how does this word, action, or decision end up glorifying God? If I can think about the origin of anything, honestly, but I can also think about the outcome of anything that I've done, now I'm beginning to really challenge myself and make sure I'm pleasing the Lord and bearing his fruit in the world. Second idea from this big section of the text. Let's drop down to verse number 18. And notice that this is actually preparation for a difficult set of circumstances. Verse number 18. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. It's already hated him, already rejected him. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. Again, it's this connection between knowing and not knowing, revealing the true source of our actions and motives. The world has already hated him, therefore it will hate anyone who is his disciple. Thus, don't be surprised when you are mistreated. It's true that since verses 9 and 10, 12 and 13, it's true since we share in his love, we must also expect to share in his suffering. You'll notice when he gets to chapter 16, he's going to say, I'm telling you these things. I've spoken these things to you so that you might not fall away. 16 and verse 1. It's going to be challenging when they mistreat you. Chapter 16 and verse 4, he says, I've spoken these things to you so that when their hour has come, when they do turn against you, you'll remember that I told you it was going to happen. He doesn't want them caught off guard, knowing that the world will turn against them. Decades later, Peter, another one of those apostles who was present on that day, would say this to Christians who were struggling through persecution. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Just think about that, that concept of some, as if it were something strange happening to you. Jesus says there's an easy way to be loved by the world. Just do what the world does. Let the world guide everything you do. Or you can be drawn from me and live how I live and know the world is going to mistreat you. So if we are caught off guard and confused, well, why does the world mistreat us? Why does the world write us off? Why does the world treat me this way? It shouldn't be strange. It's a construction we've chosen. I'm going to draw my life from Jesus Christ, and those who do not will not understand. And thus, they very well will mistreat us. Then verse 13, rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. There's always something greater. That goes back to 15 verse 11. My joy may be in you and your joy may be full. He lived for something greater, therefore he could endure no matter what he faced. Likewise, because of the glory he secures for us, we can endure mistreatment as well. So when you get to verse number 20, 
It's going to hearken back to something that he's already said again in this previous, in the same discourse, but previously. It's back in chapter 13 after washing their feet that he says, a servant is not greater than his master. Meaning, as I've served you, you you're going to have to be a servant. But here he's going to use that same logic to make a different point. A servant's not greater than his master, therefore, they mistreat me, they'll mistreat you. You're following me. You're going to be my disciple, 15 and verse 8. So you can expect that because they mistreat me, they'll mistreat you. Now, he loves to use this phrase. I didn't realize how often he used this phrase. I, I knew it from this part of the text, especially from 13. But he uses it quite frequently in his preaching. A servant is not greater than his master. And sometimes he even uses the word disciple is not greater than his master, like you find in chapter 15 and verse 8. Disciple, be his disciples. One of those times is Luke chapter 6. It tells a parable that's in conjunction with it. They both kind of have the same outcome. But maybe 39 is more negative and 40 is more positive. He told them a parable, talking about generosity right before this and, and overflowing with following him in that regard. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher. You see it? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. What does it mean to be a disciple? It means that we are willing to be fully trained by him in order to be like him. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciple. Disciples bear the fruit of Jesus. Well, here, this parable and this verse, number 40 after it, is talking about a clear process. And you can look and see and, and answer the question, where am I headed? Where am I going? By also answering the question, who am I following? If my life and my training is after blind people, quote, I can know where I'll end up. I'll end up in a pit. But if I'm truly following after Jesus, and I'm willing to be fully trained by him, then I want to be and will be more and more like him. And the concept behind fully trained is it's not the main normal word for disciplined or trained. It's actually the idea of restoration, making up or supplying what lacks. It's used to talk about the disciples mending their nets to catch fish. So it's this concept of us being not what Jesus is, but moving into a state where we are more and more like him. We're repairing what's broken. We're, we're fixing what's been crooked. We're correcting that which we've been deceived about. To be more and more like him in order for us to make the difference in the world for him. So it's the, the world's hatred works the same way as the fruit in our lives works. They hate us because they hate Jesus Christ. Because ultimately they hate the will of the Father. They instinctively, the world collectively resists the notion that there is a greater authority, something more powerful, someone more powerful, someone more intelligent, someone more loving. Because they reject that notion, they will reject anything that comes from that. And it's not surprising that for those who, in the quote world, who do seem to respect and like religion, the, the basic understanding is, well, everybody's okay. Everything is, is acceptable. Well, that's clearly not in keeping with what the Lord would have because there's one way to one God, Jesus Christ, the one way to the one God of the universe. So we need to make two distinctions, two significant observations here. Number one, when he says the world hates us, that's not an excuse for us to turn against the world. That's not what he's saying to do. He's preparing them for an environment that might provide difficulties, but he's still saying that's the world you need to bear fruit in. So Jesus isn't contradicting himself here by saying the world will hate you. He's not creating an us versus them mindset. He's saying the world will do that. The world will turn against you. The world will try to make it us versus them. But all along, we're still trying to show and live out the love of the world, the love of the Lord in the world. He says later in this prayer, chapter 17, that he has sent as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. It's a true construction. He prepares the disciples to send them into the world. Verse 21, that they may be one, that the world may believe that you have sent me. It's his whole point, his whole goal, for others to know he has come into the world to save the world. That's the point he's made throughout the gospel. 
John chapter 3 and verse 16, we know verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his son, that whoever believes in him might not perish or should not perish, but have everlasting life. But verse 17 is crucial too. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God so loved the world that he sent his son, and he sent his son to save the world. And then just a couple of verses later, verse number 19. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world. He came into the world to reveal truth. Light gives life. You cut off light, and people begin to suffer. 6 verse 33, I'm the bread of the world. The nourishing bread of life has come into the world. John 8, 9, and 11, both the light. I am the light come into the world. And then chapter, chapter 12 is a crucial chapter in the whole book. And he says, verse 31, I have cast out the ruler of the world. Meaning, there's coming a time when he will once and for all rid the world of the grip Satan has had upon the world. See how much he cares about the world? He's destroying the world's number one enemy, an enslaver. And then verses 46 and 47, I have come into the, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. You might be in darkness, but you don't have to stay there if you will come to me. I did not come to the world to judge the world, but to save the world. This matters a lot in terms of this fruit-bearing concept. Because a perfect world, a perfect world who already knows the Father, who already loves perfectly, doesn't need fruit. But he's telling us, you're going to bear my fruit in an environment who doesn't automatically accept you. And because they don't know God, they need to know God, and it'll be through you and the life you live and the fruit you bear. But what it does do, second idea here, is it does reveal that we cannot be his disciples while also drawing from the world for guidance, for nourishment, for life, for acceptance. Chapter 14, verse 27, he says he's going to give us peace, but it's not as the world gives peace. Do I give peace? If we try to get peace in the world's terms on one hand and peace on God's terms in the other, we'll always come up short. The world's will always overwhelm us and it'll always leave us wanting. We'll never find true peace. Verse 33 of chapter 16, in the world you will have tribulation. Specifically, he's talking to the apostles because of what we talked about in chapter 15 here. You're going to find mistreatment. But listen, in the world you'll find tribulation. Every person in the world can say that's true. Even those who reject God would say, yeah, there's, there's earthquakes. People suffer. There are evil governments, evil people in positions of power. And so there's wars, even though the average person in those countries don't really want war to happen. So in the world, there's tribulation. That's just the truth. So what happens when we're drawing from the world and we want to fit in with the world? We're going to begin to suffer and to die away from the Lord. And then, of course, 18 and verse 36, upon Jesus being arrested, he says, If my kingdom was of this world, my servants would be fighting. But my kingdom is not of this world. See what he's done? He's saying the identity of my kingdom is such that it doesn't go by the world's marching orders. Therefore, the people in my kingdom, they don't either. And how, do you, how can you know, Jesus? Well, they're not fighting. They're not getting into every little argument like the world does. They're not overreacting. They're not getting caught up in the ways of the world. They're instead living by me because they're in my kingdom and drawing life from me. I've used this before, but it's such a clear illustration to think about a scuba diver. He's down in one realm, under the water. But he's not living off of resources of that realm. He pulls his, masks off, his mask off, or if it gets knocked off, in just a matter of seconds he begins taking on water, he dies. But he's down in one realm, living off the resources from another realm. That's what Jesus is trying to get us to see. You're connected to me, thus you're connected to God, all of who God is. And it's through that connection you'll be able to live and bear fruit and make a difference in a different realm, the realm of the world. And as soon as you take your identity and your life and your meaning and your purpose from that lower realm, the realm of the earth, you'll begin to die. You'll begin to leave him. It forces us to choose. Will we choose to live in the realm that loves you and makes you his close, intimate friend? That's what Jesus says he's done for us. Or will we choose to live in and draw from the realm who will hate you, 
and mistreat you and operates by enmity and turning against. One thing I think that's interesting to notice as we wind down, that's the point John's making in 1 John chapter 2. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's, it's a choice. Pick one. Then he lists all the things, verse 16, that are in the world. Those three categories, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life. Notice again, origin. It's not from the Father, but it's of the world. The world's passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides. You see John's key word? John, or he says, abides forever. What's interesting is you've got this little construction in verse number 15. Do not love the world. And yet, we know God loves the world enough to save the world. And so clearly, John is telling us, don't set your affections on the world. There is still the need to love the world enough to save the world. But notice the difference in this verse, this passage, compared to chapter 3 and verse number 16. God did love the world. I believe I did a great job of emphasizing the word so last Friday night. For God in this way loved the world. How much? In what way? That he gave his son. But verse 15 of chapter 2 of 1 John, don't set your affections on the world. Why? Because everything that's in the world takes. The world is operating by desires. Take what you want. Take what makes you feel better. Take what makes you look better. Take what appeals to you. So love the world in such a way that you give. Love one another in such a way that you give. And what you give is always coming from God and his love. So we want a simple construction that tests our love and tests our obedience. It comes down to are we giving or are we trying to get? Are we trying to collect? Are we trying to grab? Are we trying to meet our own needs and desires? You know, when you get into painting something, maybe you've got multiple colors the rule is it's generally pretty simple. You start with the lighter colors first. Because once you, once you roll that paintbrush into black, you can try to wash that out all you want. It can look like it's completely free of all black. But as soon as you take that brush that's been mixed in black, and no matter how much you think it's empty, you run it in white, now you're going to have gray paint on the wall. Jesus says there's no room for mixing. You can't draw life from me while drawing life from the world. So thankfully, he gives us a new life. We become a new creation. We obey the gospel, become a Christian. We don't have to mix. The longer we mix, the longer we think we can get away with it, the more we're deceiving ourselves because we get to choose. We get to choose to draw life from him. So this morning, if that's a decision you know you need to make to, to begin life in him, to put him on in baptism where he promises to forgive and to save and also to transform and change, give you a new life. Let today, this morning, be the time that you do that. And we've got plans for lunch that will be great afterward, but there will be no better reason to kind of push the timeline of that back than to help you put Christ on in baptism this morning. Uh, perhaps you need the, the church's prayers. Maybe you, you need forgiveness of sins. You need to make that desire known in a public way. Uh, we'd love to pray with you about that. Maybe you need prayers for something else. We'd love to assist you with that as well. Please know that God loves you and we love you. And this time now is for you. Come now as we sing.